Yeah. So, 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 you know, since we've been around for a hundred plus years, we have a unique relationship with the, with a lot of the uh, uh, authorities. Um, I can give you a, a great example is that, you know, we, um, CBP was the first um, knock that we received at the door when Uyghur went out is that, you know, they wanted to see how it would impact, you know, importers and exporters. So we explained to, to CBP some of the concerns we had. We, you know, we, we had that conversation, you know, even before, you know, it, it hit the press for a lot of uh, companies and we were able to influence how they went out and educated the communities. Before we get started with the show, here's a quick word from our sponsor, Global Training Center. As trade compliance professionals, you want to make sure that your procedures and documentation are completed as correctly as possible to avoid any delays and possible fines. We provide a range of trade compliance courses that will fit your needs. From in-person or web training to recorded on-demand courses, we can train one or even thousands on your team through your learning platform or on our portal. We can even customize a private session for your team. Go to globaltrainingcenter.com to find out more. Okay, folks, uh, welcome back to Simply Trade. We're in for another show, and it has been kind of, uh, for Lalo and myself both, I will tell you, we have been kind of uh, extremely busy in this springtime, and we've been recording a lot of shows. And I got to say, man, thank you so much for your uh, your listenership. You got, y'all are downloading our shows. We're on the uptick. It's, it's continuing to grow. And uh, something that's coming up too is we are uh, we we had a fun time this week. I, now understand we're recording these shows and then we edit them and publish them a little bit later. And poor Lalo and and uh, our team yesterday we were recording one and I was in Jonesboro, Arkansas, of all places, on a great great little town and all that. But I was recording from a coffee shop thanks to Southern Confections in uh, Jonesboro. But the internet was a little uh, uh, slow at times, sketchy and and whatnot. And and Lalo and Mara, I, my apologies, but man, that was some great times and great shows and stuff like that. But uh, I hope it came across real well. But Lalo, how you doing, my friend? Well, we're doing really good, and uh, that that episode's going to come out really good. I think the content is going to really make a lot uh, make up for any little you know, issues that we might have had. But, you know, we had our, our first um, uh, fan round table or fan show, per se, you know, and, uh, and, and the, 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 we had some really good feedback from, from, the, from the audience. And so it was really good. But anyway, um, speaking of being really busy, so, yeah, you're right. Um, we had reached out to several people and all of a sudden, you know, as um, – I guess spring break ended and uh, travel stops and ends. And then the new, the next wave, as I call it, of uh, conferences are coming. You know, we, we got in touch with, uh, with uh, the next um, uh, guest. And uh, so this is going to be a little bit of a emergency show. We're coming to you all on a day that we normally don't publish the show, but we felt that this is very important. And we thought, let's get it out. Let's, let's spread the word. Um, I'm talking about the AAEI um, um, the, the group AEI, but more specifically the, their, uh, conference, it's coming up on June 19th through the 21st. And, uh, that will be in DC. We'll hear a little bit more about that here in a little bit, but, uh, we're actually really lucky to have, uh, the next, this next person on, on the show and you know him better than I do. Andy, go ahead. Oh man. Well, I want to tell you, uh, we have on our show, uh, Eugene Laney, uh, Laney, excuse me, if I can get that out of a sudden, I'm choking. Uh, Eugene is the, uh, I guess your, your title there, my friend is what president and CEO or, or yeah, what? The CEO. Yeah. Of AEI. Okay. That's correct. Of, uh, the American association of exporters and importers. And, uh, I think that the uh, crew that was doing the interviewing and all has, uh, have picked a, a really Really uh, good candidate there, and, and good leader, and, and I think that's good. Um, he, we also have Chris Ironheart that's also on from AAEI, and he's uh, he's been a good uh, friend as well, and, and a good supporter in there. And many of you all probably know him, but I will say I've had the privilege of working with both of these gentlemen, uh, Eugene. Uh, and I both were working on uh, uh, express courier related items for many years and uh, had uh, worked effectively. And I got to say, Eugene, you have to be 
one of the most pleasant, professional, and fantastic people to be around. I'm really telling you, you'll, you're going to forget more than I ever am going to learn. So I was always so elated when we were at the table together working on uh, on some issues. But welcome to our show. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you for having me. But before we go any further, Andy, I just not, I want to note that uh, autograph basketball behind that. Who is, is that? When you play, <laughs> what, is that what is that back there? What is that? <laughs> that, that was from his NBA years. <laughs> <laughs> now, actually, that was uh, one of the first teams that I've ever uh, got to coach. Oh, and, wow. Okay. Uh, we, we did, yeah. I, I coach. I used to coach girls basketball. Okay, okay, and uh, and had a uh, wonderful time with that. And it was just you know, and it's one of those that is uh, it's cherished because of those girls. Yeah, um, yeah. And, and it was a great time. So I appreciate that. We we also had the uh, privilege of becoming a state champion several times oh, wow, okay. in the in the state of Tennessee, and went down to nationals, and we finished up uh, in the top twenty five several times. And so it was quite a, a, a great run. So. Yeah, that's 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 good to hear. We really appreciate you guys having 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 me on. So this is this is my uh, 18th month at the um you know as the head coach, I guess you could say of AAEI, American Association of Exporters and Importers. And what I get all the time from folks is they you know, I say AEI and they're not really familiar enough to spell the whole thing out, you know, for them. But um yeah, we've been around for about 100 uh, plus years if you if you're not aware of it. Um we go back to the days when Boeing was making furniture <laughs> and not aviation, you know, equipment. So we go back away and, and we really help a lot of U.S. exporters and importers as well as other companies in sort of, you know, growing global as, as well as trying to educate them on trade compliance. And and I know, Andy, you know, a lot of the sit downs that we had in customs or when we were at FDA, I, I remember the times we were at FDA a lot, you know, we were frustrated banging our, our, our fists on the table. And so we do a lot of that here at AEI. We really try to figure out ways that we can advance, you know, the issues that are important uh, to our members, as well as, you know, looking forward to see what's coming down the, the pipe. You know, AI is on TV all the time. So we have to, we're working a lot on our conference this year, uh, June 19th through the 21st, to f- focus a lot on technology. So we're really looking, a lot of the sessions focus on identifying what is going to be this new ACE 2.0. You know, is, will it have AI? Will it have blockchain? You know, how is, is, is it going to impact importers, exporters, trade service providers? And then we have all the other, you know, issues that are sexy for trade geeks like ourselves here on, on the call Stuff like forced labor, you know, we want to know what's going on with the next generation customs, export controls. And uh, I was in, uh, you were in Arkansas uh, last week. I was in Louisiana. So I was in New Orleans and I, I didn't get a chance to get the, you know, everyone actually, did you get a chance to drink? And you had, a, you know, the, the food and all of that. You know, I was talking about the challenge between uh, national security and, uh, and trade. And so that's really what, you know, we're dealing with a lot here in AEI is trying to look at those issues and figuring out how we can find that, you know, that, that balance. So that's where we are. And I really appreciate you guys having me on. Well, I, it's greatly appreciated. I, I, I know that uh, with the different committees and, and things of that nature um, in some of these agenda items, uh, the forced labor, there's no question. It's permeating throughout both exports and imports. Um there's some issues that uh, of recent that are concerning to me uh, regarding some of the environmental type laws that are coming out on the books in Europe, especially. But the U.S. seems to be very uh, supportive of it. And I'm like, this is going to be extremely expensive and, quite frankly, in my opinion, devastating uh, to uh, it, it, it'll be impeding uh, trade uh, for a lot of good countries, especially U.S., on uh, l- uh, trying to levy a uh, carbon tax now on, on imports uh, into different countries. And all in the guise of saying, well, we want a clean planet. Well, that sounds good, but I've yet to see on anybody taking on the true top countries that are uh, polluting, uh, if you will, when it comes, uh, from that perspective, India and China. And yet everybody else is having to pay the thing. It's like, well, what's going to happen with that money? They're just, just another way to levy a tax in my personal yeah, opinion. Yeah, it's, it's interesting we'll to bring there. that up because those two issues are are connected. Most people don't realize the forced labor and environmental goods piece, but it's really just, um, you know, 
the interests of customs authorities to sort of measure and track uh, social compliance issues. So you brought up the environmental because I was at the WCO a few weeks ago and um, it came up that, you know, some of the European laws, one of which shocked me. I didn't realize that there's uh, provisions in some of the EU proposal, EU legislation that's going to look at you identifying the GPS coordinates it, in force to sort of determine whether where you're, you know, um, extracting that that wood or whatever that material might be. Did it come from a force that's protected? And and how are, you know, companies going to have to be able to measure that, track it, and provide that data when they try to cross the border? They don't have the right GPS, um, you know, coordinates. They could get taxed. And so a lot of that, you know, just like with the forced labor pr- uh, piece creates a lot of, um, you know, compliance issues for companies because they have to map their supply chain beyond you know, tier two to, you know, all the way down to tier five and figure out, um, you know, whether they're, you know, violating some sort of social compliance rule. And then I was with a company a few minutes ago and they were saying, well, I asked them, I said, well, forced labor impacting you. And they said, not directly. We're not doing business in China, but all of their upstream might be impacting them. So any sort of widget or any kind of component that might go into their final product, they have to then track it and make sure it's not connected to forced labor. So that's really a big challenge for companies. It's one of our biggest issues. We're trying to make sure that customs makes that process transparent. They create, you know, a sort of a trusted trader program for those companies that, uh, you know, do it as, as much as they can to track their supply chain through technology and other means and making their supply chain known. And they can sort of go into that known bucket versus the unknown actors that are out there. So it's a lot of work that needs to be done in that area. As we're looking through this and all the things, we're getting into some complex type stuff. So let me ask this question, Eugene, is from your perspective, how is it that your organization can or is able to try and, shall we say, exercise some influence, educate the staffers and the congressional folks or the agency folks, whatever, what, what is it that's, uh, you know, why AAI as far as uh, what you're striving to do? Yeah. So, 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 you know, since we've been around for a hundred plus years, we have a unique relationship with the, with a lot of the uh, uh, authorities. Um, I can give you a, a great example is that, you know, we, um, CBP was the first um knock that we received at the door when Uyghur went out is that, you know, they wanted to see how it would impact, you know, importers and exporters. So we explained to to CBP some of the concerns we had. We, you know, we we had that conversation, you know, even before, you know, it, it hit the press for a lot of uh, companies and we were able to influence how they went out and educated the community. So one of the things we did was we put together some road shows in partnership with DHS and, and CBP to go out outside of D.C. Because if you think about it, Andy and Lala, you guys have been here a million times. You know, a lot of people in Jonesboro or New Orleans or in Sacramento and Seattle or uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, they've never been to D.C. So they don't get to sit in meetings. So what we just decided to do is put together some road shows and take D.C. national. So we went to a number of major cities and, and the big topic was forced labor. So we, so we went there, partnered with CBP to educate the trade community on the for, on the Uyghur Act, as well as some of the WROs. And we also use that opportunity to educate them on every other issue that, that's important to the trade community, everything from export controls to new uh, customs modernization to ACE uh, to, you know, where are we going with some of the free trade agreements or are we having new free trade agreements? So really our relationship and partnership with the agencies allows us to educate them. There. So that's the, the good cop part, part of it. And as Andy, as you know, you've been in these meetings, so that's the good cop. We have the bad cop part of it is where we we really, once we get them in the room, we're able to then put people into the into the room. We're able to put people into the room that can add some of the hard questions, ask some of the hard questions. And that's really what happened in those road shows where you had companies raise their hand and say, you know, hey, you know, I'm the compliance person. I'm the CEO. I'm also the, the person who's, who's loading boxes. How am I going to be able to map my supply chain from A to, you know, to D? Or you had a large company saying, well, you know, I manufacture something from here and it's come from here to there for the last 50 plus years. You know, can I be then considered, you know, trusted? So, you know, creating those forms where we can have that, you know, exchange, I think, allows CDP to learn more of how it's impacting us. And I think that's what AEI brings to the table. We're the technical experts. We're very different than other associations. You know, we we are considered an advocacy organization, but we're the advocacy organization of the technocrats, the trade nerds, the folks that 
really dig into this. It's not the folks who, you know, get the the white paper that explains the summaries of what, you know, what the issue is about. They live the issues day day, um, day in and day out. So they're the ones that can really art- articulate the issues. And that's what CBP, FDA, USDA, um, you know, the Fe- Federal Maritime Commission, they all look from that, you know, for that from AEI because they know that we have that expertise to provide that. Well, I will say that this uh, past week I had the opportunity to sit in at a luncheon that uh, a, uh, uh, a judge, Stephen Vaden, from the uh, uh, International Court of uh, Trade uh, or U.S. Court of International Trade, I guess it is. Forgive my uh, uh, <laughs> judge. Forgive me for b- botching that. Uh, but he uh, gave a great uh, talk. But one of the things that came up that, I mean, red flags are going up all over the place. And that is, it appears that, or it seems like the, uh, what is it, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is seemingly trying to broaden their jurisdiction to include review of export, U.S. export items. And in that, going so far as not only reviewing that, but also they may be looking at requiring licensing uh, for certain products. Yeah, yeah. So one of our big, one of our one of our bigger, uh, you know, our big issues that we're pushing that is actually bringing on new members is the whole push for one USG, one U.S. government at the border. If you think about it, Andy, after nine eleven, and I was I'm old enough to lobbying for the for DHS. It, DHS was supposed to be the responsible parent. It was supposed to be the parent that determined, you know, risk. And the risk at the time was terrorism, but risk also included everything from broccoli to what we had the day fentanyl to, you know, bomb in a box to people coming over the border, um, you know, seeds. DHS had to determine, you know, prioritize, prioritize that risk. We've moved so far away from that to the point of what you described, Andy, where you have agencies that they don't really have the budget to have people at the border. They don't have an international trade uh, com- um, component or subcomponent within their agency. They don't even have a trade ombudsman. Someone who can meet with the trade and say, OK, we're, we're propo- we might propose this. You know, how is it going to impact you? They don't have that sort of communication channel. So we want to really get back to one USG, the idea that Someone, you know, whoever it might be, and there's a number of different proposals that are out there, um, whether it's, you know, the border and agency um, group that they have today that it composed most of the uh, agencies that have authority at the border. Is it CVP, responsible parent? Is it a DHS assistant secretary? Or is it as high, of, high as having some f- from the White House? But someone needs to determine risk. And every other job, you know, in corporate America or where you worked at FedEx, I know when you went through this, Andy, there was someone who determined that risk. And they was the person to say, you know, let's put the resources on this high risk. You know, maybe we don't need as much resources on on this risk because they're trusted, you know, but we don't really have a one government approach. So you see that happening, Andy, where you, these agencies, something will come in vote, something will happen, come across the border. And all of a sudden this agency with an alphabet that we're not familiar with, or the average person isn't familiar with, snails their big rallying cry to get out there and stop everything at the border. And and they don't have the resources to do it. And so it has a huge impact on, you know, on, on us moving goods. And so we're really pushing hard. Find that responsible parent, whoever that might be. Allow the trade to provide input, you know, on what's going on at the border to that responsible party. So they can then rank the risk and then send that out to all the different agencies and allow us to get the trusted known folks through. And the unknown folks, you can focus on that. It makes it it makes it easier for resources, too, because then, you know, you don't have to put so much money towards, you know, going after the big, you know, big companies or the well-known, um, you know, uh, smaller companies. You can just focus on the unknown. So that's what that's that's what we're focused on. So we have a lot of members that are joining because of that. They want to really work with us to put, you know, proposals forward to Congress as well as to to DHS and to, uh, to the White House on how to get to that one USG. What are the? I know there's different committees or groups within AAI. What what are your committees? What are they focused on? Andy, we've got ten substantive committees, and so when members join, we encourage them to participate with us uh, as because we're a volunteer organization, um, and the members of AAI work together to to 
try to remove some of these obstacles to trade that we've been talking about. Um, they include the customs committee would be, you know, one of the obvious ones that we would have being AAEI. And we have an export committee, of course. But we also have a couple of narrowly focused committees like the Aerospace and Defense Committee, the Textiles Committee, the Healthcare Industries Committee. We also have these other committees that, including a border interagency committee, our own border interagency committee that's working on one USG. So if you're interested in being a part of the leading edge and really representing your company uh, in a way that gets the information first, um, you're able to go to your CFO and talk about the issues that are coming up. Um, being a part of AEI really gives you an extra edge uh, internally uh, at getting your work done and improving work at your job. Um, but the 10 substantive committees, most of them meet once a month. We have uh, Zoom calls. You know, most of our meetings are done by Zoom. Um, some of them are done in person, but the majority of them are done, you know, verbally over the phone or with, a, you know, a Zoom link or something like that. And it's when members come together at our annual conference that they meet one another. Um, and that really energizes our membership. At, and it also is an opportunity for non-members to see the kind of work that AI can do. This particular conference coming up, Andy, is uh, all of the sessions that we have across the two-day program are all uh, hosted uh, sponsored by our committees. So if you're wondering about AEI, going to our annual conference will give you a really fast uh, jolt of what our work is like. All right. So with that and with the association that, or with the uh, conference that's coming up, do you have to be a member to attend your conference? No, no, no. You don't you don't have to uh, you don't have to be a member. So we have uh um <laughs> You know, members, folks have been coming to AEI for the you know past uh, 10, 15, 20 plus years. But Lee Sandler, I think, is our longest what uh, visitor of our conference. And then we have a lot of newbies, and then we have a lot of non-members, folks that that have heard about us from um, the road shows or from um, you know me going out and speaking in different communities. So we have a lot of non-members that that will walk out. And I think the the uniqueness of having it here in DC is you get a lot of unusual suspects you know some of the folks that that come from they might be a, you know a you know a company that that's just doesn't have a trade compliance person but they might have their general counsel office here or they might have their lobbying group here but they don't have a trade you know group and they want to come and, and be a part of the conference so you know DC allows you know some unusual folks to start you know coming in non-members that can show their interest in, in AI we, we see a lot of that. Eugene, um, and in the conference, um, you're you're talking about also concentrating on technology a lot. You know, with a with a with a blockchain and AI and all that. Uh, is that also representative in your trade show? Um, like with your sponsors, have you yeah, seen that? Yeah, definitely. Um, is. So, so with our trade show, you see a lot of companies that are offering products in AI, blockchain, mapping, forensics, all those different tools, and they're going to really showcase. A lot of those tools during our um, exhibit exhibit hours uh, each day. Great, great. Yeah, we saw we saw at a conference that we attended recently where those tend to those were very popular. You see swarms mm -hmm. of people around those because yeah. they're the new kid on the block. I you would yeah. say you know because uh, yeah, and they have a lot <laughs> well, of money. That's... They have a lot. <laughs> they have a lot because they're yeah. viewed almost like these startups. You know, these companies, yeah. the old well, dot are, com yeah. companies. You know, they've gone to an investor and said, "Hey, we've got this law." And then, as Andy pointed out, all these environmental goods laws that are coming down the road, and investors give them money, and and they have, you know, they create these tools. And a lot of these tools, tools are based on existing um, products. We have one company that is built up of former FBI forensic folks. You know, folks that used to, you know, like the CSI. And they're using CSI for forced labor, CSI for environment, you know, environmental goods. That's one of those things where we've been doing some uh, shows recently. It, it's still been a challenge because customs themselves, CBP, but also customs in a lot of uh, countries that have implemented a uh, forced labor pre prevention, anti-slavery type legislation, and they still don't know quite what to do. And so they're kind of heading into new ground and it's, it's uh, very subjective. There's not a, an objective saying if you meet X, Y, and Z criteria, you're all right. You can meet it on one shipment and, and do the same thing on the next and the next one gets held up. So it's, uh, it's kind of crazy. Countries can't figure out whether they want to do it 
you know, they can do it at three areas. They can do it at the border. They can allow it to, to pass the border and move on, or they can do it before it even gets here. And countries are uncertain of how, you know, at what point do they really want to address that risk because they're afraid, you know, if they don't catch it, and then, you know, the, then the, um, you know, the communities, you know, that are supportive of addressing forced labor will come after them. So it's a, it's a really tough issue. You know, countries are really having a hard time trying to address. And then you have some countries that don't even view that as an issue and they don't want any part of it. And so, you know, you have the issue of then where, you know, where's that coordination between customs to customs, you know, and, and trying to make it easier for our exports, as you noted earlier, Andy, our exports to then enter another uh, country's import. Right. And it's, you know, and there are issues there where I've always said, uh, you know, for the longest time, U.S. goods have not been treated fairly abroad. And, uh, you know, people have tried to look at free trade agreements. Well, I'm looking more of how about fair trade agreements uh, and, and looking at some things that way. But listen, we need to wrap this up. But I would say that in in gearing up for your um, convention that's coming up or your, your conference is coming up, it's uh, if somebody were thinking about whether to get involved with AAEI, your conference would be a good firsthand place to find out what are the issues that are going on, especially with those different committees that are uh, putting forward the the agendas. And you can look at it and say, uh, is this something I want to uh, deal with or not? To our listeners, look, definitely check out the AAEI, excuse me, dot org, I believe is the web page. Look at the uh, the conference. It's going to be well worth uh, attending, even just to educate yourself, let alone to consider joining AAEI. Uh, it's, it's an organization that would be pushing forward regulatory and industry affairs issues with agencies, with uh, congressional uh, uh, staffers and, and representatives, and, and uh, obviously with the White House as well. So I will say that, Eugene, I appreciate your, your discussions. Man, dude, I, you know, one, uh, we could keep we we could keep on talking and all that, but I'm also not only has it been a pleasure talking with you, but I got to tell you, for what it's worth, I'm really proud of you and, and, oh, and what you're you. doing thank in you. the organization, buddy. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Good, good seeing you. And for all the non-members out there, we have a great group rate. You know, huge discount. Three non-members for fifteen hundred. So that's a great bargain if you're a non-member. So. Um, you know, go to the website and definitely uh, um, come join us June uh, 19th through the 21st in Washington, D.C. at the Renaissance. Thanks a lot, Andy. Really great seeing you. And what I'll do for everybody that's listening in, if, just so you can have notes um, on the show notes for the podcast, scroll down and I'll have a link to uh, obviously to Eugene and to Chris's bios, but also to AEI, to the conference as well. That way you can just get there quickly. So so I'll we'll we'll make sure to add that and uh, and make it easy for you all to find. So thanks, Eugene. Thank you very much for joining us. Simply Trade is brought to you by the generous contributions of Global Training Center. You can follow the show and GTC on LinkedIn or Twitter and other social networks. Make sure you check out the show notes in the description for a full rundown of today's show with all the important links. Also, make sure that you share this with a friend and subscribe on your favorite streaming platform. We really like hearing from you. If you enjoyed the show, make sure to rate and review wherever you listen to this podcast. If you or someone you know would like to be a guest in the show or would like to sponsor Simply Trade or suggest any topic you would like for us to discuss, please contact us via email at simplytrade at globaltrainingcenter.com or you can DM us on Twitter at simplytradepod. Thank you again for the privilege of your time. Happy trading. Simply Trade is not a law firm or an advisor. The topics and discussions conducted by Simply Trade hosts and guests should not be considered and is not intended to substitute legal advice. You should seek appropriate counsel for your own situation. These conversations and information are directed towards listeners in the United States for informational, educational, entertainment purposes only and should not be substituted for legal advice. 
No listener or viewer of this podcast should act or refrain from acting on the basis of information on this podcast without first seeking legal advice from counsel. Information on this podcast may not be up to date depending on the time of publishing and the time of viewership. The content of this posting is provided as is. No representations are made that the content is error-free. The views expressed in or through this podcast are those of the individual speakers, not those of their respective employers or Global Training Center as a whole. All liability with respect to actions taken or not taken based on the contents of this podcast are hereby expressly disclaimed.